You want to not lose your workings while also keeping your soul. Yes. Hey, Nadia. Hi, Lena. <laughs> I like to be where the people are. Lena, why do you hate Goodreads so much? Why'd you have to be such a spoil sport? You grind so many axes, I don't even know where you're getting them anymore. Are you sleeping with a metal smith? <laughs> Well, I have more thoughts than toes at the moment and I'd like to share them with you. But first, some news. As a lot of you might know, um, during this Skipfire 2020 year, I've been running these creative lock-ins called Lena's Lock-ins on Instagram and also on here, where we write alongside each other. It's very chill. It's like a pub lock-in, as in no pressure, you're among friends, there's candlelight, there's no high expectations. and. Because it's National Poetry Day on the 1st of October, I'm teaming up with the National Poetry Day people, who I love, uh, to put on for you a 24-hour poetry lock-in. Yes, if you want to watch me do that, or if you want to join in, all poetry levels welcome. Very beginner to poet laureates, you are all invited. It's going to be 24 hours of writing workshops, little events, midnight feast, a poetry showcase, lots of writing prompts, all are over on my Instagram. It's starting on the 1st of October to the 2nd of October, midday to midday. I might die, so it'll probably be entertaining, whatever happens. Especially if you're feeling uninspired or lonely or weird during this time, I think it's gonna be a really special event. It's completely free and you can join from anywhere. So if you want to hear more about it and you wanna make sure you don't miss it, make sure you're following me on Instagram and make sure you sign up to my newsletter. Yeah, that's all I had to say. I didn't want you to miss anything. Uh, back to shitting on Goodreads, I guess. But here's the thing, I don't even hate Goodreads. I don't even not like Goodreads. Considering I was the person who made a video in 2013 talking about how I'd never get a Goodread account, if you are not internally frustrated and exhausted by your past self, are you even cool? I have grown to love Goodreads over the last, I'd say, two, three years. I've really started loading it up on my browser before I load up Facebook or Twitter, taken joy in cataloguing my reading adventures, and from adding all of my Patreon people on the Gumption Club as friends, I found some really good recommendations I would have never found before because I'm watching what they read. However, there are arguments for and against Goodreads, both personal personally and globally. And I'm gonna go through both of those right now. So personally, oh, it's just, <laughs> I am genuinely losing my eyesight, guys. I thought that was a dog. <laughs> the three things that make me hesitant about the concept of a Goodreads model, not necessarily just Goodreads, but a website where you record faithfully everything you read. One, one of my favorite books is The Rights of the Reader, which is a book about how important not having rules or gamifying reading is. Parts of it are about the process of reading and how important it is to put a book down when you don't like it, to read it in a non-linear way, to play with it, to not rush through books. And there is an element of the reading challenges. I don't think it's the mechanism's fault, but the human element of it is, is to continue with books you're not enjoying so that it still counts as a read. To rush through books, uh, especially like what makes me hesitant about that is rushing through books that aren't about your experience or are non-fiction books where you really need the facts. I think it's really easy to fall into the trap of loving having read something rather than actually reading it. It can also encourage like a binge culture around books where what's not important is how deeply you consume a thing, how, how much you meditate it and understand it and really comb through it. But the quantity at which you're consuming things. That's why like the movie bros on YouTube drive me mad because you have to have watched every single one of their genre of films to be able to discuss anything at all. The third thing is the way we mark books on these websites, like five stars. I don't know if you've ever been judged by a GCSE moderator on how much they like your drama interpretive dance rather than how well you did the drama interpretive dance, teenage scars aside. But I don't think as an artist, it's fair to be judged on how much somebody got what they demanded from the piece rather than how good the piece was. So I think I see a lot of people on Goodreads reviewing stuff because they're like, oh, I didn't like it because they didn't get together at the end and that's what I wanted when that wasn't the premise and it's not in a romance drama where that's not promised. I gave this one star because I didn't realize it was set in Rome and I had a really bad experience in Rome once. So I really hate Rome. So that's why it's one star. <laughs> There's community plus and minuses to democratizing like how we score stuff, but it's hard to give a nuanced view with just five stars because those stars are so personal and for me, I give a lot of things five stars because I think they fulfilled their 
promise and I think they're well done and they're they're polished even if I don't think it was like my personal hold it to my chest favorite book of all time whereas other people wouldn't give anything five stars and wouldn't dream of it and three stars is a really fair oh that's a pretty good book rating so anyway I don't think the star system is nuanced enough and it scares me but on the pro sides the reason for having a mechanical website place where I record what I'm reading is it has really stopped me from hoarding books a lot of the time I was hanging on to these material pieces that probably should be back in circulation for reasons for the environment because I was worried that I'd forget <laughs> that I'd read it or I wouldn't have it to hand to like visually have a representation of having read it. So instead I've started writing down in my notebook like my favourite quotes from a book or my favourite bits of learning from a text and then I've got it out of my life. I've pushed it out into the world, I've posted it to a Patreon, I give away like a book every single week on my Patreon Facebook group um, or I give it to a charity shop or I give it to a friend and that has been the biggest change actually for me in starting to use Goodreads in the last three years. It helps me share quotes from books I've read without being obnoxious and pushing it in people's faces. I like being able to catalogue um, stuff when I've read it in ebook and just automatically post it to my feed when I think there's a really valuable learning so I can like twist people's arms and make them read the book from the lovely quote rather than like directly being like sitting down with a friend in a coffee shop and being like let me just read you this page from this book that I love. Although I do do that sometimes still, cool. It helps me assess way more plainly my biases. I can put the grid view, view on and just sit there and count like how many men I've read versus how many women, how many people of color I've read versus how many white people yet again. Seeing them all laid out on the floor with the amount of floor space that I'd never have in real life is amazing. Another thing is when I find out my biases and I realize them, there are lots of community built resources and lists on Goodreads that show me very specific authors with certain identities or experiences all cataloged in one place, which is a thing that the publishing industry doesn't often provide and newspapers don't really provide either. And then lastly, I just like to turn up where the people are. It's why I'm still using Facebook. It's why I'm still using Instagram, even though I don't agree with the practices of those companies. I like to be where the people are. I wanna see, wanna see them reading. All of my friends are on Goodreads. I've made friends through Goodreads. When I'm looking at a book and deciding whether to read it or not, I can see which of my real life friends have already read it. And then I can just text them and be like, yo, what do you think of that book? rather than taking months every time I see a friend in person to be like, have you read this book? Have you read this book? Have you read this book? It's all there so I can skip to the conversation part. So then Lena, if it's so good, why do you wanna leave? 90 million people use the site and you've got a reason why you don't like it. Who do you think you are? Well, this is a story all about how a couple called the Chandlers started a very wholesome, pure, MySpace-esque book site 15 years ago. They started it so that they could catalogue and exchange recommendations with their friends. And also one of their explicit things they started the site for was to help people widen their reading pool from the very small reading pool that newspaper review sites and like WH Smith shops and probably eventually Amazon curated sites uh, where it's really hard to discover more unknown books, new authors, stuff like that. That's literally one of the reasons they started it. And discovery is something that is obviously not always anyone's fault. It's that like in the UK at least, the volume of films versus the volume of books that are made every year is insane. In 2018, there were 319 films produced in the UK. How many books? 188,000. So Goodreads launches in 2007 and by 2013 it has 15 million users and that is the year that Amazon acquires Goodreads. Did you know that Amazon owns Goodreads? It's something that haunts my dreams but I imagine my dreams are quite niche. And I remember when Amazon bought Goodreads and I was a... What was I even doing? I was either a bookseller or it was my first year in independent publishing. Can't remember. When Amazon bought Goodreads, I remember it and I remember it being like a symbolic sadness for me. It's how I felt when Safeway bought Asda, who were bought by Walmart. It's how I felt when Penguin bought Random House, when Waterstones bought Foils, when Amazon bought, well, everything. 
The site now has 90 million users. And what's weird about it is that it kind of still looks like it did in 2007. Like the only way you can really find a book is by ISBN. People have numerous complaints about its functionality or things that it's missing. It's only just got a reread function. And that's weird because Amazon tends to, especially when it's acquired something with such a huge reach, and such huge market value, you'd think it would invest more in making it better for the users. Is the cozy startup, oh, we're just a cranky, rusty, quirky, cozy book website, is, is that part of the strategy, I have to ask? Because Amazon never does anything by accident. Is it because market research suggests that if too many people know that it's owned by Amazon, it will reduce the footfall to the site and therefore they won't be able to sell the adverts on the site? Because another thing that's changed uh, with Goodreads is that all of the adverts are sold by Amazon and all of the adverts obviously run against the ethos of the original site because it's pushing the books that already have the biggest amount of budget and the biggest amount of money and usually privilege behind them to the surface. I probably don't need to go into all the reasons Amazon isn't the greatest company to support and I am most definitely not the poster girl for boycotting Amazon. I, while I don't buy physical books there, I have had a long history of being an Audible subscriber, which I am now eking my way out of. If you'd like a video on that, let me know. And I did recently pay for a month of Amazon Prime so I could watch Utopia. It's the only climate change drama that I could find, please. Also, if somebody can point me to like an ethical streaming site, that would be great because when people are like, oh, just pay for Netflix instead, I'm like, mm. that's kind of like saying, would you rather be left in a room with Ian Brady or Myra Hinley? Like, mm. <laughs> I don't buy physical books from Amazon. That is the part that I really see some very ethical alternatives to, very easy to do, and there is literally no reason for me personally to buy from Amazon. There's a much more complicated conversation to be had around affordability and books. <sighs> do we have time for that today? Probably not, but I will get into that at some point. So I'm not, if someone was to come to me and say, look, I am on minimum wage and I really wanna support the book industry, but I really don't have very much money and I don't have a library that's near me or that's very well stocked, I would never be like, oh, you shouldn't buy from Amazon, that's really bad. But for me, where I am, I know that I can ethically buy books in a very easy way. So for physical books, why wouldn't I? So there are obviously loads of reasons to move away as a customer from Amazon. The way they treat their workers, the fact that they don't really pay any tax, the environmental impact of their packaging. While I don't think it should be down to consumers, um, to police that. I think it should be in the law. And I don't think there should be any judgment for people who do. I think that the more we can all collectively take a step back, the better. And also I think my biggest bugbear when it comes to the relationship between Amazon and Goodreads is that Goodreads for the first seven years of its life was built by the community in good faith. It's kind of not like an exchange of a book existing and then somebody buying the book and I guess making the book possible by buying it and financially supporting it. Or in the same way, I guess me making these videos and then you guys watching them. You support the channel by watching it, but you don't actually make the content on the channel. That's just me. In the same way with a book, you can support an author, but you don't actually write the book. With Goodreads, most of it in the first seven years of its life was built on the good faith of unpaid, I would wager, though I don't have the statistics, female, labor because most of the good resources on the site have been added manually by Goodreads librarians who are unpaid volunteers who like you have to like qualify my friend Sana's one where you can like add books yourself it's like a special thing so a lot of the reason that like while it's really hard to find a book it will probably be on the Goodreads site and and with all the different covers and all the different languages added is because a Goodreads librarian has done it it's not because somebody from Amazon or somebody was paid by Goodreads and the other wonderful part for me of the site is the user built lists which historically built up over 15 years is an amazing catalogue of information. The same with the groups and the articles. They're all things that people have for free given to the site, which makes the site what it is and is the content of the site with minimal development from Amazon, really. Like if, if, they've talk, if they tell me that they have spent millions of pounds investing in this site, I'm gonna tell them that they need to get the money back from the web developers because holy shit, this is an ugly site. <laughs> anyway, I'm getting overexcited. I think that might be my biggest key bugbear is obviously all the other like conventional stuff to do with Amazon, but it's also that element of it that the actual thing has been built by people for free in the understanding that it was an independently owned company. And there's been no user awareness around the fact that it is owned by Amazon. So most people continue with their lives assuming that it is an independent site that they're giving away their free labor to. <sighs> 
And that brings me to the question, are there any alternatives? Where do we go, Lena? What do you want me to do with my virtual bookshelves and my great noggin? Where should I put it? Well, I recently heard of a very cool alternative. So over the years, there have been some brave enough to try and compete with Goodreads. Mm, sometimes they seem to be made by people who either have never used a computer before or don't really like reading. But even when they have been pretty decent, it's turned out that Amazon has just bought them and then not developed them just so they won't become competitors like Shelfari. Remember Shelfari? However, I've been hearing on the grapevine about a new book cataloging website that looks a little bit different. It's called the Storygraph. It's independently owned and it has way more features than Goodreads. It's still in beta, but I thought in for a penny and for a pound, I'd rather waste my time than yours. So I thought I'd give it a go and see if it was worth it. So the day of reckoning. Will Storygraph live up to expectations. I'm here looking like I'm attending Mr. Blobby's 30th birthday party on the set of Grease. <laughs> Does anybody else do that? When they get dressed, they just like have to like look in the mirror and self own for a second. <laughs> anyway, I've got my laptop here. Love that I thought that I was gonna be able to do this without my glasses. What optimism, Melina. Ow. <laughs> okay, so here we are. We are at beta.thestorygraph.com. Dot com. It is still in beta, so I'm gonna give it a chance. I've been using Goodreads actively for about three years, and I have heard that you can convert your Goodreads data, so I wanna make sure I do that as I'm signing up. I don't wanna miss my chance at that, and I don't wanna fuck it up. Um, my username better be free or I swear to God. Oh, okay, the literal first step. I look how blatantly it's like, have you come here from Goodreads? Do you want to not lose your workings while also keeping your soul? Yes. So it's showing me how to export my good, okay, export. Okay, kick off the import by clicking the button below. You'll receive an email once your import is complete. Import my Goodreads library. Ooh. So they're importing it right now. I'm waiting for an email on that. Let's set up my reading preferences. Ooh, okay, a survey. Love a survey, get to know me. Pull out my insides. What are your favorite genres? Ooh, what have we got? Okay, so we do have quite a few like more specific genres, which I like. We've got LGBTQIA+, magical realism as a category, that's great. Autobiography, I love a good memoir. Self-help, you know it. There should be a climate section. If I can put that to the beta gods, I would like a climate anxiety section, please. Um, and race, that's something that I definitely need to learn more about. Poetry and nature, I think. I think that's what, that'll be the closest to climate change, right? So magical realism, self-help, race, poetry, and nature. Let's see what they give me. Which of these characteristics do you appreciate the most in books right now? Ooh, okay. I'm interested in high quality writing, learn about the human spirit, experience and behavior, unreliable and morally ambiguous characters. Are there any genres you don't like or aren't interested in reading right now? Ooh, okay, cool. I don't really wanna read about art. I don't wanna read about video. Here we go. How long do you have? This is an unlimited box, I like that. If you hear a fuzz, it's because my computer's uh, overheating a little bit, bless it. It's been a hard day, hasn't it? I've what, sent three emails on you? Fucking hell. Anyway, which things, if any, turn you off books the most right now? Oh, predictable plot. Complete the sentence, I am never rarely in the mood for books that are. I like that it's asking as much about what I don't like as what I like. Also, can we talk about how I had a little bit of a 30 year old breakdown and pimped my laptop with friend stickers, please. <laughs> and when I say, can we talk about, I mean, can we never discuss this ever again? Oh, so it wants a sentence. Tell us the kind of books you like to read. It's very important you don't mention anything you don't want to read about. Okay, so it's gonna read my keywords when I write this paragraph. God, this is actually making me think about what I actually like. Uh, what do I even like? Who am I? You know, there's like enemies to lovers trope and like other tropes like that. Where is there a trope for? women who leave religion because that is a category I'd like to read about. I want like more complex tropes, not out of this because this is what this is what it's scanning for, but I'm like, now it's making me think about the tropes that I'd like to, future tropes that I would like to be a thing. Children overcome capitalism trope. Nurses on a quest for self-actualization trope. Will it into being, will it? Okay, we've received your survey answers. So my recommendations that are tailored to me, I think properly will be available soon. And my data isn't plugged into this yet. It's supposed to take up to 24 hours. So I'm going to wait and I'm gonna log on tomorrow and see uh, what it's like to use when I can play with all my own data and all my own books. Let's circle back, reconvene, put a pin in it. <laughs> I don't miss offices at all. Okay, bye. So it's day two. I have come back to realize my uh, 
Goodreads graph cleared about 10 minutes after I stopped filming yesterday, so great. I am really impressed with that, that was actually really fast. It said it could take up to 24 hours, but in fact took about, I don't know, 40 minutes. Something I didn't mention yesterday was how clear and clean the design is. I actually really like that. One of the things that stresses me out about Goodreads is how busy it is. Another thing I'm a big fan of is the kind of 3D-esque style of the video, of, of the books. It makes it feel more tangible and less digital and more like, oh, look at that book that I read. Um, these are my currently reading books. Yes, <laughs> there are seven of them. Um, they're all correct. They've all fed through really well. Luella's Guide to English Style is actually a different cover for me. I'm noticing that they only have one cover option per book at the moment. But again, this is beta, that might change. Um, I'm totally fine with that. This is actually a better cover than the one that I actually own. I've got a Just For You section that's now really accurate. Um, I love Sophie Hagen. Wizard of the Crow. Challenging, informative, reflective, slow paced. Get me in there. That's my to read pile that's filtered through pretty well. That looks good. So one of the issues I've seen with my data being fed through is that I on Goodreads have currently read 88 books this year. And uh, it's saying that I've only read 72 books this year. First, I'm gonna set up a reading goal, which is the same as Goodreads, which is a hundred books in the year. So I've, I'm that much through. However, um, when you look at what is actually missing from this list chronologically, it's, the books that are from smaller presses. So what I'm gonna do, this is an example, um, and then she ate him by Tom Denby. Um, I'm going to take the ISBN 13 number from Goodreads. I'm gonna double check that that's why it hasn't loaded because it'll be in here yet. So the story graph doesn't have it yet, but you can import the book. So let's try and import this one. So this one is, I know it's on Ingram. I'm not sure where they pull their data from. Um, this is like publishing talk. Uh, but this book is from a small press, it's called Burning Eye Books, but this book is available on Waterstones, so it should be pullable from whatever data set they're using. Let's see. Yes, it is. Okay, cool. So I think that means that it is now added to the Storygraph library. I have added this book. Okay, this is exciting. I feel like I'm part of something. It fed my review through as well. That's cool. I didn't know it was going to do that. That's cool. Okay, so there are some discrepancies um, within that, but I think I'm okay with that. I think I can, the majority has loaded and I can totally spend about 15, 20 minutes fixing that. I think that's fine. And then obviously ongoing, when I add to it, it will be completely correct. Let's go through some of the other features. So now that all my books are loaded, I want to see my reading stats. Oh, I really like this. Okay, so the biggest category the books that I read fall into is reflective, uh, emotional and challenging. The pace, I go for a medium pace, that's true. I'm not really like a big fast genre reader. I need to work on my 500 plus pages um, thing. Maybe I should make a video about that. Uh, I have read a little bit more fiction than non-fiction, but that's a pretty good spread for me. And actually I really would prefer my reading to be more non-fiction, I think. And they're my star ratings for now. <laughs> okay, there is a book that I am a one hour away from finishing. It is Why We Eat Too Much. So I am gonna see what it's like to mark something as read and see what the review process is like. I'm going to switch to read. Add the review. Okay, so, oh, okay. So what does it ask me? This isn't just a, a I'm so happy. <sighs> the stars are there if I want them, but I can also review it in these ways. This book would be for someone who is in the mood for something uh, informative. And I would actually say this is hopeful. How would you rate the pace of this book? Medium. This has changed my whole approach to food and weight. Incorporates historical and sociological factors as well as accessible science, kind of like a sapiens for food. Really excellent. And then I'm done. And this is where you can add reweeds as well. So that's exciting. So the other feature I wanted to explore that I've heard good things about is down here. So it's in the new on story graph section. And if you press browse all books, you can filter what you're looking for. Um, kind of like going into a bookshop, I guess, and being like, this is what I'm looking for. So I think I want uh, a fiction book. I want it to be slow or medium paced. I want it to be hopeful and inspiring and light hearted. I just need what is essentially an uplit book right now. I've read a lot of climate change shit. I need, I just, just need a hit of happiness. Um, include any of these genres. I'd love some uplifting crime. <laughs> Can somebody start writing that, please? I mean, it's Scooby-Doo, really, isn't it? And I really, really, really don't want to read a classic. I'm okay with up to that amount of pages. Something that's not on my to-read pile. I like that feature. 
You could also feature, you could also search by books that you own. In case you don't really have a handle on what you own, I guess you could just filter by what you own so it searches your own bookshelves for you to tell you what to read next. But let's filter and see what happens. We've got Split Tooth by Tanya Tagqua. Zadie Smith, Now, Flight Behaviour. So most of these I haven't heard of. Oh, I love the cover of this one, New People. This sounds so good. Okay. Maria and Khalil, her college sweetheart, are planning their wedding. They are the perfect couple. Um, king and queen of the racially nebulous prom. <laughs> they live together in a black bohemian enclave in Brooklyn, where Khalil is riding the wave of the first dot-com boom, and Maria is plugging away at her dissertation on the Jonestown Massacre. Uh, this sounds so good. They, are, they have landed a starring role in a documentary about new people like them who are blurring old boundaries as bra and a brave new era. <laughs> to read, another one that th it threw up for me that I really like the cover of is Call Me Zebra, feisty heroine's quest to reclaim her past through the power of literature. Zebra is last in a line of anarchists, atheists and autodidacts. When war came, her family didn't fight, they took refuge in books. Now alone and in exile, Zebra leaves New York for Barcelona, retracing the journey she and her father made from Iran to the United States years ago. Sign me up! <laughs> so, so far, that's looking really hopeful. I really like that. Um, there's obviously like things on my wish list of things I wish it had, but in general, it also does loads of stuff that it didn't even occur to me that Goodreads didn't do. It completely nuances the five star thing, which is my pet hate. And also I think the discovery features look a lot more nuanced and a lot less computer driven. And it looks like as people add books and then score them for what they what's in them and how reflective or happy or sad they are, um, that data will just keep growing. And that will be a really useful set of metadata from which to grow more of a community which I think is really cool, especially because that's not a bit of metadata that the publishers like supply. The publishers supply genre, or they're usually only allowed to pick like one genre or maybe two. Um, you're not allowed to like really mesh them and be like, it's all of these things, uh, but it doesn't have to like provide stuff about the tone of the book or the pace of the book. Um, so that's all like really interesting. So after being absolutely floored by that, I, in my pessimist mind was like, it's too good to be true something else going on here. And what better way to find out if something is legit and genuinely good than talking to their founder? Hey Nadia. Hi Lena. <laughs> it's funny because when I, before I started working on the story graph, I've always been a, um, I've always been an avid reader and um, I worked on a bunch of different products and ideas. And um, when I started toying away with this reading side project, it was the first time I really felt like yes i really need to be doing something based on books it's like this they call it like a founder product fit and i was like i have to make this work because i love this so much so even when people telling me don't bother there's goodreads there's amazon you can't do anything in this space i was just like i have to find a way because i'm i'm loving it like, yeah, well that's what i think i think part of the reason that amazon often wins is just through other people thinking that they're indestructible when they're not what does beta even mean because i use that word a lot and i throw it around and i read it on the top of websites but like for for a laywoman like me like what yeah. does beta mean and what does that mean for the story graph so like high level is that um a beta is a test version of a site so it's pre-launch and it's essentially communicating to the customer that there's going to be more bugs than you would expect in an official product but also that the pace of change is changing daily based on user feedback and so what it means for the story graph is um yeah there are things that are we there are a lot of things we still need to work on there's some features we don't have yet um there are some bugs the user experience in the ui is not quite there we still need to do some things on accessibility whether it's like the colors dark mode making sure the alt tags and descriptions are everywhere all that kind of stuff um and also making sure it's fast all the time and slick and th at that point we'll get to a point where the core product is good enough that we can say this is, you, your expectations should now be here. Like before, you know, bear with us. We're, we're learning, we're trying to learn from you, but now your expectations should be here. And one thing I do want to say is that we've got a lot of messages from people that assume that once we launch, um, it's going to be a, we're going to stop taking feedback because, but that is far from the case. The way I want to run this company um, and this product as it, Go, grows over the coming like months and years is I'm always going to listen to customers first. So I'm always going to be doing customer research, finding the product is never going to be finished. It's just that you can have higher expectations once we launch, but it's never finished. We're always, it's always going to be a work in progress. And we want to work 
with readers to move with them. So, so you know, as readers' behaviors change or habits change or the publishing book markets change, we need to adapt our product too. It's not just going to be the same. That's amazing. And so what does it mean for you to have beta users? Like how does that, how does that like help the like story graph solidify and grow and open? Like what, what's the impact of joining early? So the impact of joining early, as a lot of people are finding, is that they really are getting a say in which features are coming in for launch. Um, and they're also helping us make the product excellent. It's also really useful testing things at scale that maybe worked with 10 users or 100 users yeah. that did not work with 10,000 users. <laughs> and also just be part of our community. Because like I said, even you, I think it's more just being fun to also say that you've been there since the beginning because we're going to keep listening to customers. And I think it's just going to be fun knowing that I was there at the beginning and they were changing things and listening to us and I'm here however many years later and they're still, they're still uh, changing things. And also any early users watching this, keep us accountable. So if wherever you, whenever you're watching this video, that's something that I've never heard from Jeff Benzos. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm working on right now is building in content warnings to the site so that we're, we're going to start with um, hopefully by the end of this week, wait, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> hopefully by the end of this week, users will be able to add, tag their reviews with certain content warnings and also say the level of detail. And then eventually we're going to use that um, data to allow people to, in their reading preferences, say, hey, I'm sensitive to X, Y, Z. And so we'll be able to say, okay, let's not show, um, let's not show any of these books, you know, let's not show any of these books. Um, and because of the way um, the survey is, where you can edit it any second, it, whatever you're in the mood for, maybe one day you do, you can handle a certain subject matter. So you're like, sure, show me everything. And maybe the next day you can't. And so say no, I don't want to see it. Um, what, do you have like a mission for the site? Is it something that where you're like, I want to build, like build on the kind of model of, of sites like Goodreads, because Goodreads isn't the only person that's on it. Um, or is it that you, like, you want to make something completely different? Or is it something you're like, I see that this, this idea of a website book thing could be bigger. Like, do you have like okay. a dream? <laughs> so I have a, we have a, a product mission and a, and a company mission. And it's okay. funny because people message saying, I don't know anything about your company. And I'm always like, we're in beta, don't worry. Once we launch, we'll have a proper landing page yeah, yeah. and we'll have a proper thing like that. Um, the, the product as it is right now, the aim is to be the place to help you choose your next book. So that's not necessarily find new books. It's like you might have a big TBR shelf. You might be part of a book club. You might want to diversify your reading or you might not have a clue you want to read. And we want the story graph to be the place that you go to to find your next book. But there's a wider company mission, which is enhancing the lives of avid readers everywhere and inspiring non-readers to read. Now, when we get to that level, who, like the, the scope of possibilities is so much broader. We might bring out, other products, um, other apps. We might, you know, you let our tech power other businesses or things like that. You know, people have been asking about API, other developers, they want to build their own charts and things like that. You know, we might have an API to help other people. We might help um, other companies and websites improve their recommendations. Like the, the possibilities are wide, but as long as it fits into the, so right now I'm focusing on that product mission of how can we really, solve that recommendations and discovery problem but the company mission for the story graph is a lot broader in my mind but that's kind of we're talking like years down the line so. yeah yeah i guess there's a thing like the, the two things that people are hesitant about with goodreads is that it's owned by this this guy it's precarious who it's owned by and also um they don't pay their taxes i just wanted to ask like who owns the story graph and do you pay your taxes very two very simple questions <laughs> the company is owned by myself and also yes. um rob uh, who mm -hmm. joined as a partner recently um and we own it 100 percent um all of it so it's and we bootstrap it as well right now um we have looked into different things like accelerators and investors but we are wary of that track but we want to be open-minded so as long as it supports the mission we're, we're open-minded but we we want to keep running this in-house for as long as possible um and forever if possible um but that does rely on us finding a, a sustainable and profitable business model yeah that makes sense and you pay your taxes right 
all the taxes. Like <laughs> Amazing. Personal taxes, Perfect. business taxes. <laughs> I'm on the accounts. I do them earlier than you <laughs> than you need to and like and pay the taxes before I'm crying. That's beautiful. Uh, so that was Nadia. Isn't she bloody amazing? Obviously, Storygraph is still in beta, but I've still been finding it really useful and it's great to get on early. So you can click the link below to join. This really sounds like it's sponsored, but it's on honestly not. Will I leave Goodreads? Yes. When it launches, I'm very likely to just completely leave Goodreads. Like, why stay? Do you use Goodreads and would you consider leaving tell me in the comments below do make sure you're following me on instagram so you can hear more about the 24-hour poetry lock-in thank you so much for watching more booktube videos up here and until next time frog snug out